Yeah, we just wanted to, to give you an opportunity to reflect on some of the findings that Bobby had uh, presented there. So, you know, as we've explained, we've been, you know, we're working towards having a broad understanding of the impacts of the pandemic on um, ethical tourism development in the Arctic and in northern areas. So we want to get as many perspectives as we can through the survey that we've done and also through the webinars, uh, such as the last one and some of the fantastic presentations we've had today will help us kind of with that understanding as well. So we just wanted to take this opportunity to, to get some feedback really on those preliminary results that we have, um, just to say that we are, you know, we'll be getting more responses, I hope, to that survey. So they'll become kind of uh, more well-developed as time goes on. Um, so, but we had those four themes there. We've been looking, you know, at the general impacts of the pandemic on ethical tourism, on the opportunities that have arisen um, as a result. And we've had some fantastic accounts from the presentations today. Um, also sort of coping and recovery mechanisms that stakeholders and communities have put in place to kind of deal with the, the, imp the impacts that they faced. And then that kind of the vision looking towards the future there, looking at a more ethical and sustainable tourism, a more community focused tourism um, as another way of kind of managing those impacts. So I'd just like to ask if, if, if you think that the presentation that Bobby gave there kind of reflects your own experience, or if you think there's some gaps there, um, some perspectives that we might have missed in the work that we've done so far. We're trying to both capture sort of key tourism stakeholders points of view on some of these questions but we also have a focus on trying to capture the perspectives of more marginalized groups so we've had talks today about kind of women in business about indigenous groups and fantastic examples of of how they've been able to kind of um kind of put together really positive initiatives during this time um, but we're also very aware, for example, of the impacts on youth and some of the other research we've done have shown those to be quite profound. So that's another group we would like to try and understand, you know, how they've been affected in some of the communities and areas that we're looking at. So I'd like to ask you all if you, you know, if you could give us some general feedback on the on the findings that we've um, produced there. That could be gaps or, or kind of new ideas. Uh, Rachel, you've got your hand up. Uh, well, I would just like to say, uh, Bobby and Rosalind, that that's the first time that I've heard a tourism talk that thinks about tourism like me, because I'm so used to hearing them with just greed, 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 and not thinking about the environment at all. And it's I'm so delighted that um, to be A, on this panel, this webinar, and, and B, to know that there's mo not just me, because there's... Isla's quite wealthy in tourism. It's got different tourism and different environmental, uh, different job aspects. Like we don't have unemployment in Isla. So Isla had to be looked at differently in the tourism sector, but the tourism industry didn't pick that up until about three years ago, four years ago. We were fighting, you know, I used to try and say to them, your, your things are, we don't need them here. We need to be looked at differently. Um, but we need to have a huge awareness uh, no one talks about ethical tourism. No one in Isla, apart from me. <laughs> but I didn't even know that that was a phrase to use. I just go on about, I love the planet. You know, <laughs> they just think that you're a bit kooky. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to use this uh, phrase going forward now. And I'm going to say, it's not just me that thinks like this. You need to pay attention. Because if, you, if you've got, if you just make money all the time, you're not going to have anything left. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You have to. It's pointless. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm inspired. I'm inspired. <laughs> and that triggers a question for me, I suppose, in that how do you communicate what you're doing to the wider whiskey industry in Scotland? Because, you know, it's a, it's a significant industry that is a, it's a land based industry covering a large area. So have you had discussions with other stakeholders in the sector about some of these issues? Uh, not not on a level like this, but we are we we we're starting now. We're doing a live um, broadcast once a month. It's called IWA Live, and it's going to be the only. Well, no one talks about things uh, deeply and meatily because they're all scared to offend each other. But you see, because I'm independent, I can just say what we think. So we're we're talking about COP twenty six and now. Um, our one on the 24th of November, our next live broadcast. 
and we we've already been picking up points you know that so the industries had a big uh, the scotch whiskey associations had a big involvement and a lot of uh, pr about it but it tends to be um a lot of these things are so for instance they make huge big um wood wood burning um, boilers and things like that you know it's like when they went from records to cds but we really had digital and we didn't need cds so they're making all these big uh, boilers that we don't need that's cutting down trees that they could be using the sustainable renewable energy but we're not nobody wants that because they don't make money out of that so it's a very difficult area but there are companies like um that's trying to think about whiskey you know be be more ethical so there is like a, a a small network of people and we'll have them on our show i think the show will be the best way to reach people because it's a live thing and they'll watch to see because you know you could you could do anything you could you know it's not recorded so it's so, so maybe that'll help reach people yeah no thank you that's really useful i think a lot of it is about network development isn't it and just be able to link into something with a with a common aim because i'm sure there's lots of people that have you know do have some of these aspirations but it's it's difficult to know who to link up to i think sometimes thank you have we got other comments Ah, Becky, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, sorry, I can't turn on my video. It's amazing. No uh, hello, thanks very much for this talk as well. It was really interesting to, to see these perspectives. Uh, I think it would be, I mean, I don't have anything to say much about the survey yet because I've not taken it, but I think it would be interesting to do something similar in maybe in one year time or two years time to, to see, you know, because I feel like, um, pe for example, um, people's relationship with nature has changed qu quite considerably. Over the course of COVID, uh, something that we've been looking at in my studies, not necessarily in tourism directly, but um, I think that people's version of what they think of tourism and how, you know, how they feel about tourism will probably evolve in the years to come as well as COVID kind of hopefully fades away or maybe comes back or, you know, we, no one really knows because the future is so uncertain and uh, yeah. I think people have kind of just learned to live, to learn to live to cope with COVID right now. And that's what we're in the midst of. But I think it would be it's quite interesting to have that kind of reflection in a year to see what the attitudes of people would be then. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think when we started this project, we were thinking that it would all be over by now, as we've thought many times. But the reality is most of us haven't even been on a holiday abroad yet. So I think we're all kind of struggling with what the new notion of tourism really is. So. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. And yeah, I hope we can carry on with this kind of work in the coming years as well. So any other general comments about the themes that we, we presented there? Is there anything you think we've missed? I would be interested if anybody does have perspectives on the, on the youth angle. You know, how do you think that the younger people in tourism have been affected? Because it seems that we, we've heard a lot about negative impacts and in, in terms of unemployment and, and just young people kind of experiencing a lot of hardship due to just living in peripheral areas and a lack of access to their, their normal social activities. And there's been lots of mental health issues as well. But it does also seem through this, this kind of increase in digital technologies, there's also a lot of opportunities for younger people you know, to get involved in setting up businesses and potential perhaps to kind of have more people coming into some more peripheral areas. So do people have any experience or perspectives on, on that group? Because that's something I feel we haven't touched on so much. No, it's too much uncertainty perhaps. <laughs> And there's still lots of people without jobs, I think. I think Rachel wants to tell, talk oh. something. Please, Rachel. Uh, well, I don't really have much uh, about uh, the youth, obviously, because my business is for people over 18, really, kind of, you know. But my friend is a school teacher, and she told me that the, she sees in the children that they've lost their gallusness. I don't know if you know what that means. You know, it's like there's swaggered about life and you should have that when you're young 
And I think that's very sad that COVID's done that. You know, it's made, I don't know what how that's happened, whether it's a lockdown or whether they've just been, it's like children in jail or something. But the, she's found that in, in Isla, anyway. I mean, probably probably many people have found that, but the, 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 the cheeky ones that would swagger in, you know, it's like a lot, they're a lot smaller. The people are a lot smaller. It's mm -hmm. quite sad. Yeah, I think that is a it's a common theme. I think on you know some research that's you know it's it's related to this, I suppose, but it was about COVID recovery in rural areas and you know this the mental health issues that you know had come out as affecting even quite young children was was quite stark actually. And I think you know the focus for recovery has very much been on on the older generation in many areas. So you know that was something that was was quite striking. Yeah. Right. Okay, I don't know if anybody else. Uh, Yes, please. I haven't got my name on the screen. Um, I was going to say something which is sort of related, it's not completely youth, but it is uh, related to the women sort of theme that we've had today. Um, from my own personal perspective, um, I had been on maternity leave for six years and COVID actually presented me with the opportunity to go back to work because where I live rurally, I can't get to work when my children are in school. I mean, I just disappeared for 10 minutes there as I ran down to the school, picked my kids up, made them cycle really fast back so I could get back to the webinar, you know. But that's what COVID has provided for me. It's allowed me to actually get back into the workplace. And I'm sure there's lots of other opportunities for youth out there who maybe don't have their driving license, haven't had the opportunity to get a driving license, can't afford to buy a car or get insurance for it. But then also just people like me who, you know, are educated, can get jobs like this if we could actually physically get to them, whereas we couldn't previously. So I think it's provided some really interesting opportunities to get different people back into the workforce as well. Thanks, Ken. I think that's a, it's a really interesting perspective. And it does have, I think, a big implication for rural areas where those opportunities haven't existed in the past. So it'll be really interesting to look at those patterns, I think, going forward as well. You know, once we have some statistics on, on some of these things. So thank you. So anybody, anybody else? I wanted to ask the other question I had was around, you know, this evidence of kind of new entrepreneurial activities that have developed in, in rural areas. And I think we've heard some examples of that. We've heard about kind of new initiatives and new projects kind of that have been attached to kind of existing existing tourism businesses but have expanded into into new areas such as Rachel and Natasha spoke about so well but I just wanted to ask the other people on the call if they could you know maybe add some add some other examples to that um, have you seen evidence of diversification of the tourism offering um, or the tourism businesses branching into other activities whether it be education um, or or kind of new approaches to sales or, or anything like that because it just really help us add evidence to the report that we write if we can if we can populate the report with really nice examples, kind of in line with the positive theme that we have today about the you know visions of hope in the future. Petri, you're coming in. Yeah, thank you. Um, not that many of those <laughs> coming coming from the tourism business during the pandemic to do something else, but some, yeah. Um, there has been, for example, one one uh, small family company that used to make the living out of, of uh, tourism program, and since it was prohibited to to enter over here for quite some time, um, they managed to vary the the handicraft side in the web store and managed to survive through the through the pandemic time from that. And, and I'm quite sure that in the future it might be an important part of their the, uh, business, even though after the, the tourism is opening up. Other thing is that, that uh, for example, I have done during, during the layoffs uh, some development projects to other companies in, in other uh, industries, uh, talking about sales development or, or organizing sales departments, ETC. So yeah, there has been some, some projects that, that people have done done since there's more time on hands and no possibility to do tourism for a year and a half. Thanks very much. And you know, as as we've mentioned, we're still we're still in the middle of this. So I think there'll be you know, there'll be more new businesses and opportunities that become that are launched and become obvious. So thank you. 
And Helena, you've got your hand up. Yes, I could say a few words for this question. Besides, I'm the project leader of this e project. Uh, on behalf of Paralia University of Applied Sciences, I'm also a hotel owner myself, which has opened a small boutique hotel in my city just before the COVID. And now when we can tell after two years of opening that we indeed survived, even though it was a bit heavy somewhat for the business, we have been also making conclusions that maybe the COVID in fact was good for our uh, market presence. Let's say that the bigger competitors were closed for six months for both summers and so on. So people end up accidentally to our services during the pandemic and when they saw that yes this is nice place they have returned many times so I think even though it was indeed heavy 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 task but maybe maybe it was good for some of us as smaller players because many of the bigger were out of the game during those months Thanks, Helena. Yeah, I think there's yeah some yeah new areas have been discovered. I think in in many countries, um, new businesses being used. Any other comments on that? I think the final thing I, I wanted to ask about um, was the kind of the value of kind of more cooperation and knowledge sharing at different scales. You know, I was really interested in Natasha's talk when she talked to, you know, about the international scales and in which she's kind of now delivering products, um, kind of local local products being kind of um, reaching kind of international markets. And I'm just wondering what you think the opportunities are for kind of more international networks. Because I suppose what eTrack is about, it's about trying to kind of bring different countries together to talk about these issues and to create a network of projects and stakeholders that are learning together about these issues. Um, so I'd like if anyone has any comments on the kind of value of sort of these international collaborations, whether it's through another NPA project or through taking part in this project or through your own businesses and your, your interactions with other, um, other countries. Um, what do you think the role of that is in recovery and future opportunities? Rachel. <laughs> I don't mean to be hogging this, sorry. No, <laughs> um, um, well, can I just say that the, the W Power Network that brought me and somehow I came to this webinar through that was uh, just fantastic uh, for us in lockdown. Because on Isla, there's not that many female people like me doing stuff and why my friends support me and go oh yeah you're great oh yeah we've got faith in you they, do you know what I mean <laughs> so it's nice on this level it's nice for my heart but it might not be help me in a practical way whereas the, the we we um w power group was women entrepreneurs in a gale that were rural because any other group had been in hadn't been rural so they understood all the issues and couldn't get out my door because of the weather or blah blah and and that was a really um that was a, a nice connection and I, I found it very very helpful but now that we're not in covid it's not we're not they wanted us to maintain it ourselves which we can't really do we need someone to maintain it that we can join in so i would really like to see something like that continue because it's beneficial to us but we can't do it ourselves when we're trying to make our businesses work as well, we need outside, do, we can contribute to that. You know, I mean, I don't mind doing stuff, but I can't take the responsibility to be running it when I'm trying to run my own. So that's yeah. I've got to yeah, say. Yeah, the value from external facilitation and just, yeah, having some resources that are brought together and some guidance to, you know, signpost people through, you know, various processes. So. Brilliant, and, and like we're, we're friends now, you know, the girls that I met on that, the women that I met. So that that's nice, you know, we're supporters of each other in business and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really great to hear. Thank you. Hey, Carol, are you coming in? Got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you all for the very interesting presentations and information you're sharing here. And um, yes, I would like to 
comment on your last question because I am one of these international wilderness guides who wants to contribute to the sustainability and awareness there in, in Finland and especially in, in Lapland. And um, uh, some people know this. Uh, I'm here uh, after sharing thoughts with Monica, for instance, and I'm already working since a, a year with these um, sustainability principles in, in uh, Sami awareness and so on. But um, I must say that as um, an international guide living in Belgium for the moment, it is not easy to be part of uh, programs in the north that try to, um, to, to increase the awareness and the sustainability. Because um, I feel that the distance is really big, although we have online application, di digital application already, but it's still very difficult to, to get involved on the field. And um, for instance, last year, uh, I've been sending so many emails to the Sami parliament about these issues and never got any response at all. I understand that these people cannot respond to all messages they receive, but nevertheless, I, I sent, for instance, a question like, how can I implement as much as possible these um, sustainability principles to increase Sami awareness among my participants? You know? So I'm a, I'm a little bit here for indeed to increase the networking and uh, to see if I can and how I can contribute on the field. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, and well, E-Track will have, you know, at the end of the project, we will hopefully have quite a, a good network to, you know, to cover some of these issues. But, you know, I guess it can't all compensate from, you know, actually going to visit people sometimes. So I think we're all kind of faced with a challenge of, you know, trying to work online and, you know, working without meeting and, and that is really difficult. So no, thank you for those comments and, and thanks to you all for, for your comments over this discussion. Um, that's been really helpful. So I'm going to pass back to Monica now for some 